you very much, uh, Fira. Thank you to the Bridgejam team uh, for organizing this. Um, it's great to see so many participants. I'm going to be really, really brief because uh, I'm uh, mobile at the moment. I wasn't expected to be, so uh, I, I could lose a signal at very, very short notice. But um, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this member focus group. Um, it's important to remember that this is a privilege of memberships. It's, it's one of the value membership to be able to be part of our three member focus groups. Uh, this is one of them. I'd like to sincerely thank uh, Ellen Utomo, who has uh, worked really, really hard at tremendously revitalizing, reinvigorating this group. Um, and the, the numbers involved now are, are substantially more than they were a few months ago. And of course, this is uh, all very, very topical because uh, this is our first webinar post COP26 when we had uh, uh, 10 businesses over in Glasgow as part of a BritCham supported collaboration uh, trade mission with the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, I, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors, they're Brompton, uh, G4S and Jakarta Land and also uh, an important mention for collaboration on content for today with our patron sponsor, HSBC. Um, with that, um, I, I'm sure that this is going to be a vibrant discussion, a very, very relevant discussion. And I do hope as many of you in the audience will take your opportunity to participate in the Q&A. With that, Ellen, I'm gonna hand over to you to uh, welcome and introduce uh, a great panel. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, welcome everyone and to, to our webinar today on the future of um, uh, electric, uh, EV in Indonesia. This is a very interesting topic, uh, definitely very relevant to smart cities. And it is very relevant as well with the recent um, global um, meetings such as uh, G20 and the COP, uh, COP26 that has recently take place. EP has been a uh, very center into the discussion. So we are very excited to uh, actually have this like a webinar that covered the topic more in depth, especially for Indonesia. Uh, today we have a very um, really great like lineup of like a moderator and speakers. Uh, I'd like to introduce Pa Hikmat Rajat, who's the executive VP of marketing and product development of PT of PLN. Uh, PLN itself already been working on like EV charging points and supplying it uh, throughout Indonesia. So this is a uh, so very knowledgeable in this uh, area. Next, we'll also have uh, Christoph Gore, who is the CEO of Altelium Group. Uh, he's been having lots of experience working and implementing the, in the, some, one of the mining uh, and the, especially with the nickel. So he's familiar with the process and the investment as a foreign companies here and also the technical flow to ensure sustainable uh, extraction in on these mines. Next, we have um, Sep Gemseto, who is the Deputy of Investment and Mining Coordination of the Coordinating Minister of Maritime Affair and Investment. Uh, he's been working closely with the regulatory system for uh, EV, especially in the nickel mining. So we'll hear quite a very a very good like input from himself um, about the future and the vision of Indonesian government for this uh, sector. And also we have two speakers from HSBC. Uh, first is Nishan uh, Sudani, who is the director of future cities and new industry of HSBC. Uh, he'll be able to share with us the global trend of like how EV has been interacting closely with the smart cities and how it's contribute to its not net zero uh, carbon aim. We also have Diana Tang, who is the Director of Sustainable Finance of HSBC, who will be able to share as well, like um, the financing opportunity uh, for these sectors. Okay, uh, without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Pa Hikmat, who is going to give us an overview and start this like today, moderate uh, today discussion on, uh, on the topic, all right? Okay, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, say to all of the panelists, hi, Christopher, how are you? You are at uh, the London, of course. Hello, 
No, I'm, no, I'm in Jakarta. Oh, okay, Jakarta. And the second speakers, uh, Diana, how are you? Hello, good afternoon all. Good afternoon, okay. Salam. You are uh, at uh, Singapore. Singapore, okay. that's good. right. And uh, Nisan Sadani, how are you? Fine. Yeah, hi, I'm very well, thank you. I'm okay. uh, from London. Okay. And uh, of course, Pak Septian uh, Seto, how are you, Pak? Hi, I'm uh, good. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce of the uh, events. This is of EV uh, initiative, of course, in Indonesia. Currently, uh, the government, uh, the industry ecosystems, uh, still uh, starting to uh, penetration of the markets. Uh, I would like to share uh, one or two slides in order to uh, look at of the how in Indonesia currently uh, the initiative of the EV. At least, uh, if infrastructure uh, in Indonesia, at least they are forced uh, the same of the first is the regulations, means uh, how to accelerate EV adoptions. I think this is part of Pak uh, Septian from, from the government's uh, investment and mining coordinating of the uh, coordinating investment and maritime uh, ministry. And of course, the second theme is the, how the upstream EV industry, it means, you know, uh, more than 40 to 6% of the EV uh, dominantly about the battery. And you know, uh, currently Indonesia uh, has the many uh, raw materials of the nickels in order to Uh, how produce battery uh, locally in order to uh, support of the EV industry of the upstream. And the third, EV infrastructure, in infrastructures, meaning uh, how the charging stations at the public area available uh, easily to every EV owners on the roads. This is part of the the more important uh, EV infrastructures. And the last, how about the EV technology, meaning uh, the e-mobility platform. All of the four team, of course, uh, how the lending capital can uh, bring globally to Indonesia in order to accelerate uh, at the funding strategy. I, will, I would like to uh, introduce of the PLN EV product catalogs on the market currently. There are three uh, the product of the services of the PLN already on the markets. The first is home charging services, means this is uh, the product of uh, corporate action, uh, the PLN, in order to, to give incentive for every EV owners, uh, the discount tariff overnight charging, uh, 30%. You know, uh, how PLN, uh, it, Encourage of the EV uh, adoption currently of the Indonesia during uh, off peak hours, uh, 10 at the PM to the 5 at the EM, PLN release a 30% discount. And of course, the, for the upgrade capacity every home, we already release the product only uh, pay. 150,000 uh, rupiah for the customers. This is very cheap, uh, the upgrade capacity. The second product of the PLN is charge in platform, meaning uh, we already released the platform for the EV uh, monitoring systems. And then the last is, uh, this is very interesting, sharing economy model of the partnership charging station on the public. PLN already uh, opened the markets to build every charging station on the public. For instance, uh, at the mall, at the parking area, at the uh, airport, and so on. This is, of course, uh, what we call how we can accelerate EV adoption in Indonesia. Okay. Uh, I would like to, intro, uh, to invite the first uh, speakers, uh, Christopher uh, Goers. The time is uh, 10 minutes, of course, uh, and time to you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm, I don't have any slides, so I won't, I won't be talking to any slides on, on, for these 10 minutes. But looking at the adoption of EV um, in Indonesia and, um, and the, the essential nature of EVs to the whole smart cities concept, that if you have a smart city, an electric vehicle clearly is um, amenable to smart cities because an electric vehicle is really a, a computer on wheels. Internal combustion engine cars were, were, were simply modes of transport. Electric vehicles go way beyond that. And we saw that when, when the first Tesla was produced and its dashboard looked like a giant iPad. Um, and, and so with that, with that technology, you have far more um, capabilities in, in the vehicle. But how do we get there? And that's, that's really the, the, the question I want to address. From the, between the mine and the wheel, um, there's an extended supply line. And, and that supply line is filled by a number of, will be, will be filled by a number of companies. You have your mining and Indonesia has, has ample mining, um, ample oil reserves and is, and is good and, and experienced in mining. Then there's processing. After processing, there's refining. After refining, there is cathode production. After cathode production, there is battery production. And then the batteries are sold to the, to the vehicle manufacturers. And so some of those roles may be done by the same company or, or not. In Indonesia, the mining, to date, most of the mining and, and most of the, the um, plants reflected on the map behind my head here um, are ferro-nickel plants or you know, rotary coil electric furnace plants, nickel pig iron plants. And those plants are producing um, class two nickel. So they're, they're really designed to supply the stainless steel industry. The, 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 I, the class one nickel, which is the version of nickel required for the EV industry, um, is now best re represented in what's called mixed hydroxide precipitate. It's a nickel cobalt, cobalt hydroxide. And that MHP is the favored product for the refineries because the refineries um, don't want metal. What they want is powder. They want, they, want a chem, they want a chemical form of nickel so it can be easily converted. It means you use less energy. And then the refineries will produce the sulfates which go into form the cathodes and the cathodes go into the batteries. And along the supply chain, um, as I think we all know, the batteries form, nickel is the largest cost component of the battery and the battery is the largest cost component of, of the vehicle. And so what, is, what happens upstream is actually crucial to producing uh, cost-effective electric vehicles. One of the things that, that the market um, needs to address and hasn't addressed so far is the fact that uh, it's the cost of capital. It's the cost, it's the cost of raising the capital to, produce the, to build the plants to produce the products. And the industry at the moment, uh, it's been often said in a number of publications, the industry would like nickel to be at around $20,000 to $22,000 a tonne. And at, at that point, that price point of nickel, then they can justify the capital expenditure on the, on the processing plants. The problem with that, of course, is that if you have a high nickel price, you have a high battery price. If you have a high battery price, you have a high vehicle price. And how do we, how do we achieve mass adoption? It's, unless the market has available to it, and I'm talking about the world market, available to it, a range of vehicles at the different price points that we currently enjoy with internal combustion engine vehicles, we're not going to get there. The world is, you know, Elon Musk would love us all to drive Teslas, but the world is not going to all be driving Teslas. You also need the Nissan Leafs and everything in between. So it's finding the most cost-effective way to produce these metals. And on top of that, these metals have got to be produced in an environmentally sensitive way. The drive behind the adoption of electric vehicles is to reduce CO2, greenhouse gas emissions. It's really about clean air in the cities. That's, you know, that's, what, that's what the real driving, driving motivation is. And, but there's no point in, in having that as your objective if to get there, you've created masses of CO2 or you have created environmental uh, you know, damage or threats. And at the moment in the class one world of, 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 uh, of nickel production, MHP in particular, the only process that's, that's producing MHP commercially on large scale is, is the high pressure acid leaching process. And the HPL process is, it, it, it works. Um, it's, uh, there's probably about 11, I think, HPL plants around the world in, currently in production. Um, it's, it does have inherent technical challenges, which the, those who have tried to build the plants know very well. 
but it has a it has a negative environmental legacy. It, it produces a, an acid-rich tailing, which needs to be neutralized. And so they neutralize by adding limestone. And, and, and then in doing that, they increase the mass. So for about a ton of ore processed, they produce a ton and a half of tailings. And those tailings traditionally have gone two places. They've either gone into the sea or they've gone into tailings dams. And uh, you know, I, I understand the Indonesian government and Pak Setian will probably make comment on this later. The Indonesian government has indicated it's not really going to approve deep sea tailings disposal in the future. Um, and tailings dams present their own challenges because tailings dam, we're all familiar with what happened in Brazil so a couple of years ago, and that was an iron ore tailings dam um, upstream. But tailings dams in a country which is seismically active, like Indonesia, um, are not necessarily, necessarily the most sensible thing to build. And I'm hoping that perhaps um, you know, Diana may have a comment later on on the financing um, available if in your business plan you're going to build a tailings dam, whether you will be successful or not. So the world needs a clean, a, a cleaner technology. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough and I'm, and I'm not um, going to, to plug my company or my, my company's process on, on, on at this opportunity, but we do have a process which, which ticks these boxes. Um, the, the, the key is, as I said, green, to, to develop greener metals for the green EV industry. Um, I, I happen, happy to take any questions at this point, far or, or rest at the moment, and I'll come back later, if, if available, time is there. Okay, Christopher, uh, thank you very much for your uh, the brief information about the uh, at least there, there are three uh, initiatives uh, for the cost effectively of the production of the nickel itself. It means how uh, produce the battery more cheaper. And then uh, the green initiative, of course, uh, this is part of the uh, net zero emissions at the globally. And uh, the last is about the how uh, the globally can uh, lending capital on the EV uh, investment of the, of the uh, upstream uh, itself. I think this is very interesting of the topics to discuss uh, with the audience uh, as well. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. And uh, the second uh, panelist, uh, Diana Tang, uh, please, uh, your time to uh, give us uh, briefly. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Kipmat. Um, I don't have slides as well. I think what I can probably talk to this afternoon is really to provide an overview in terms of the available types of financings um, to support the development of the EV ecosystem. So I think maybe to a point to what Christopher raised just now as a start, um, you know, when we look at, let's say, projects, that is really more from a conventional financing perspective, not necessarily sustainable financing. Um, for project financing, you know, if projects have got um, environmentally sensitive elements, such as tailing dams, for instance, um, typically they will need to undergo a rigorous environmental assessment. So banks like HSBC are signatories to equator principles. Uh, we would have certain minimum levels of environmental standards um, that would be acceptable to a big group of financiers. So we will need to deep dive into what the environmental plan is, uh, what the assessment is, what the implications are, um, and you know what are the contingencies. Noting that you know um, obviously within the region is seismically active, um, so it really depends on the project levels. So taking a step back, when we think about financing for the EV ecosystem, there are two general big types of financings. The first is really sustainable finance. Um, when we talk about sustainable finance, it doesn't just mean loans. So there's a misconception, you know, sustainable finance is just about loans. Actually, sustainable finance is any form of uh, financial services um, that has an ESG element. So it could be loans, it could be bonds, it could be guarantees, it could be trade finance, and it's applicable to all levels of the EV ecosystem. Uh, in terms of the different types of sustainable finance instruments, there are two big uh, different types. The first is what we call the U of proceeds financing, which is where the underlying projects have to be green. So it is very specific. You use the money for some project that is green, for example, development of um, electric batteries, uh, lithium batteries, or development of um, recharging infrastructure. So that underlying use is green. 
then you can say that, look, I am taking a green loan or a green bond to finance this green project. You cannot use the money for something that is not green. The second type is what we call sustainability linked financing, where a borrower will actually obtain a pricing um, benefit or have to pay a premium uh, depending on their achievement of pre-agreed KPIs. So for instance, um, the KPIs will be related to the group. It is not related to a specific um, asset or a specific project. So typically within the EV ecosystem, what we've been seeing so far is a lot of the uh, car manufacturers, the EV manufacturers have been tapping onto use of proceed instruments because their underlying product is green, such as electric vehicles, uh, the batteries within that's considered green. So they go to the market, they tap onto green bonds. They could potentially take green loans from banks as well. Um, how do we then determine, you know, sometimes the question I get is, um, is uh, a project green, you know, for HSBC? Is it green elsewhere? So it's very hard to determine sometimes because there is no there is a there is no firm sort of a level of certification. But we do have a set of market um, principles called the green loan principles, and that is actually a voluntary set of market standards that all banks in the market would adopt. So it's best practice. There are certain principles there. You need to be clear what the funds are used for. So that is actually very common. Um, the one challenge sometimes is what if the underlying project, such as um, mining or processing, what if it is not a green activity? How do you then access sustainable financing? So some examples would be some of these companies, such as mining companies, are potentially looking at sustainability-linked financings, where they look at the overall environmental um, and social and governance implications of their projects. Um, they speak to the lenders, such as ourselves. Uh, we discuss about setting selected KPIs, which are material and meaningful. So it's not just any KPIs, it has to be ambitious. It has to demonstrate you know, um, the company's ambitions in ESG. You set a few KPIs, um, typically within the um, Asia region and within in Indonesia, it's around three, two to three KPIs. So it's not about oh, having five or six or 10. That is not the intention. The intention is really to drill down into something that is meaningful, um, agree with the lenders, uh, and recommend it to get a second party opinion from an environmental sort of um, assessor to assess that the KPIs are meaningful. And you can then um, set up your financing and link the margin uh, with a small discount of usually maybe one to two basis points per annum uh, to the KPIs. So if you achieve KPIs, you get a small discount. So in that way, if you're a company that doesn't actually have, um, you know, you're not a manufacturer, for example, but you sit within the EV ecosystem, you can also tap onto sustainable finance um, through that method because you're able to tap onto general corporate purpose financing through this. So I think this year we have seen a big uptick. Previously, it was mostly the big car manufacturers coming for financing, um, obtaining financing. Uh, we have done you know, bond issuances for Kia this year. Uh, we have done for Volvo, et cetera. And if we look at the trends this year, we're seeing more customers from EV recharging infrastructure, from the development of power management solutions, um, services providers, um, a lot of the enablers of this transaction coming uh, to us to obtain financing. So it's all across the spectrum. Um, and it's not necessarily just a loan or a bond. It could also be you know, trade finance, uh, green trade loans, green import loans, et cetera. So that's just giving a bit of a snapshot of the sustainable finance um, capabilities you know, or offerings in the market currently. Happy to take any questions as well. Okay. Or we can save the questions for, for the end. Okay. Thank you, uh, Diana, for the uh, brief uh, sharing about the sustainability uh, financing strategy. Uh, at least uh, there are three uh, initiatives here. Uh, the green uh, financing in order to uh, finance of the EV industry starting from the battery and the manufacturers. And also I think uh, for the dawn streams uh, like uh, charging stations itself. And also uh, based on the KPI of the financing strategy, this is very interesting, I think. And uh, overall, uh, this is uh, 
the new strategy for the uh, accelerates a green initiative every uh, country i think very uh, interesting then and thank you uh, very much for the sharings and uh, we will continue uh, the next uh, panelist uh, nishan uh, nishan sadani please uh, nishan sadani to uh, share about uh, the finance as well thank you sure thank you uh, good afternoon everyone it's a pleasure to be part of this esteemed panel and uh, uh, this uh, event thank you for that uh, i'll share a few slides just to take through uh, some of the concepts on smart cities and how EVs are playing a key role in urban mobility. Um, as we all know that uh, more than 500 cities are at risk of flooding from uh, 0.5 meter rise in sea levels with two degrees centigrade rise in global temperatures by 2050. And Jakarta is among one of the cities most threatened by rising sea levels and extreme weather. So this is quite imperative and the strategies to achieve the zero carbon city uh, includes predominantly shift towards renewable energy and big push on vehicles and buildings. Cities are responsible for 75% of global CO2 emissions with transport and buildings being among the largest contributors. Uh, moving on, I think we all agree that technologies are exhilarating industries and cities in a highly integrated environment, we see a lot of these technologies uh, and, and the applications of these technologies uh, manifesting itself into two ways. You know, on one hand, you see the city system applications, and on the other hand, you see the urban economy manifestations. So in terms of city systems, you see urban tech, smart cities, intelligent cities, or you can call them city 4.0, like we call it industry 4.0, and the impact it has on built environment, transport logistics, public services, utilities and securities. Uh, in terms of urban economy manifestation, we see this evolving into innovation ex ex economy, experience economy, digital economy, sharing economy, circular economy, and reurbanization of manufacturing, for example. So we see that the cities in together with the internet of things uh, is leading to connected cities utilizing technology and data to enhance the lives of citizens by improving services. Uh, this spans across sectors and has a lot of goals to improve the livability uh, in, in cities at, in general. And it also comes with quite a few challenges, including uh, challenges regarding data, security, privacy, innovation, funding, stakeholders, regulations, etc. Moving on to urban mobility, uh, urbanization is driving the demand for urban mobility. The global population is set to increase by 2.1 billion um, by 2025. Um, and it's particularly going to be in urban populations. So there will be a rise of mega cities globally. And 35 out of those 43 mega cities will be located in emerging markets. Now, this leads to a significant demand for urban mobility, uh, not only cars but and, and urban passenger, but also in terms of urban goods mobility demand as well. The next mobility revolution is happening right now and is largely driven by digital solutions. So while today we have the uh, combustion engines sort of own self-owned cars, standalone vehicles and uh, driver-driven vehicles, tomorrow it would be electric vehicles, uh, uh, you know, a significant mix of shared fleet, connected vehicles, as well as autonomous vehicles. Now, there are significant challenges that the urban mobility faces in terms of mobility and traffic or congestion, climate change and pollution, road safety, parking, etc. At the same time, intelligent mobility solutions could unlock a lot of these opportunities. What is the future of sustainable mobility? E-mobility, um, the decarbonization of transportation is central to ambition to become carbon neutral. Uh, the growth of e-mobility is an accelerating trend globally, uh, especially to reduce carbon footprint, but also air toxicity. And this is largely driven by increasing regulations and government support, lowering battery costs, as well as OEM strategies and consumer preferences. 
However, in order to be truly carbon neutral, the electricity powering EVs should also be from renewable energy as well as cleaner battery technology. Uh, EV charging infrastructure. The rollout of EV charging infrastructure is quite critical for EVs uh, to be adopted on a large scale. In fact, EV charging points could become a barrier to unlock, unlock the potential of e-mobility given the rapid growth of uh, EV vehicles uh, and you know uh, the EV charging points are still trying to play up, uh, catch up actually. The EV charging value chain is quite new and likely to evolve further as the market expands and number of players increases. The significant investments will be needed to develop a smart and flexible charging infrastructure in within an overall part of sustainable energy system. Um, one of the key points to notice is in terms of cities, technologies and uh, smart cities, EV charging stations are data hubs and you know with the promise of V2G integration, vehicle to grid integration, it could also serve as a backup energy storage for the grid to the point uh, that Christopher was making earlier uh, in terms of uh, EVs being more than you know, a computer on wheels, for example. So the application for uh, electric vehicles is not just mobility, but also the connectivity it brings to the system in the overall ecosystem. Um, having said that, I think from a sustainable mobility perspective, EVs are certainly part of the solution for cleaner transport in cities, but the emphasis would be on building sustainable transport system overall which includes getting people out of their cars and onto public transit, getting car, uh, greater car sharing and multimodal travel towards car-free cities in terms of rationing, restricting uh, charging car use and more cities reclaiming uh, streets for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as eventually the target would be to go towards multimodal mobility as a service model covering all public and private mobility solutions and infrastructure for both passenger and goods. Now, one of the key important aspects uh, that we see is the convergence of both energy and mobility futures. Now, they are quite intertwined. So while we see that the future of energy will be electric, decentralized, and digital, the future of mobility will also be uh, autonomous, shared, and electric. So they, you know, these are common themes, and they're quite critical to long-term decarbonization goals. Uh, and you know, it is highly relevant from a decentralized energy resources perspective as well. Just a few examples of intelligent cities at forefront of switch to electric transport. Uh, Shenzhen in China, for example, is one of the first cities to convert all its 16,000 buses to electric, uh, which has helped reducing CO2 emissions by 48%. In order to keep this EV, large EV fleet running, they have built around 40,000 charging stations. Now, they're clearly at the forefront of public e-mobility. Um, Copenhagen in Denmark, is rated uh, a second out of 23 major European cities in terms of good air quality. The city wants and aims to achieve carbon neutrality by 2025 and is likely going to be the first carbon neutral capital in the world. Now, there are a lot of efforts that Copenhagen is taking in order to become carbon neutral, including complete transformation of vehicles to electricity, hydrogen, or biofuels, for example. Also, uh, cycling is a big, uh, focus for the city and the target is for 50% of all commercial use by cycle. And uh, it's also complemented by the new metro, uh, which is also helps in taking off uh, the cars on the, from the street. Los Angeles in America is uh, has launched a Green Deal new plan, which in increases EV in the cities to 25% by 2025, 80% by 2035 and 100% by 2050. They have uh, ambitious plans to convert all city fleet vehicles to zero emission where possible by 2028, and significant plans to install EV chargers at public places across the city. Uh, London, where I'm based from, is uh, highly committed to introducing sustainable transport modes and tools. Now, some of the innovations that London's transport network has done include introduction of ultra low emission zones, um, new taxis, which are all supposed to be green. Uh, the Go Ultra Low City Scheme, a project that aims to deliver over 1,500 on-street electric charging points 
uh, and Low City, an industry-led program to help freight and fleet sector uh, lead the way in improving air quality. So these are some of the examples from which we can learn how um, you know the e-mobility e is is really uh, growing and how it can help cities decarbonize better. Moving on to Indonesia and the Indonesia system of cities, uh, we know that you know uh, the Greater Jakarta is is a mega city, and um, it it really is the economic center and uh, and the global mega hub in the region. Uh, we do also have two large regional hubs in Bandung and Surabaya, and then we have over twelve agile medium sized cities with a population of about one million. Uh, plus, the government's plan to make a new capital city in East Kalimantan, uh, and and these are all a wide variety of metropolitan governance models with uh, fiscal capabilities and significant decentralization reforms over the past two decades. Now, the role of electric vehicles in decarbonizing Indonesia's transport sector. Now, Indonesia has set itself the goal for achieving net zero emissions by 2060 or even sooner. Accelerating the decarbonization of energy sector will be key, uh, but the transport sector contributes close to one third of uh, emissions in Indonesia, and that is mostly from the road transport. And this is expected to increase further as the uh, as as the economy uh, expands further and and the purchasing power of consumers increases. The adoption of EVs in this regard is an important strategy to reduce emissions, emissions in the transport sector. Uh, the government has uh, taken strong initiatives to push for EVs. Since in uh, 2017, Indonesia has a nationwide national energy plan that sets target for electric vehicles. Uh, they set, uh, you know, the government has set a goal for EVs to make up 20% of all domestic cars manufactured, equaling to so, so close to 400,000 e-cars by 2025. Uh, also, e-motorbikes making up 20% of the total domestic production, and the target also includes 10% of public e-bus fleets on the road by 2025. This, coupled with Indonesia's aim to become a battery hub in the region, building on its natural resources on nickel and bauxite reserves, uh, is quite unique. Uh, and the government has announced a number of policy measures in the last couple of years to support EV manufacturing expansion. The Ministry of Research and Technology has also listed electric batteries as one of the five national research priorities for clean energy. How has all this really resulted? In? And we see this in Jakarta, who's leading in the adopting adoption of e-mobility. So while Bali created the first electric bus regulation in 2019, Jakarta followed soon in 2020. Uh, Jakarta is among a few provinces where uh, there are trial of electric buses ongoing, and the target is to procure only zero emission buses by 2030. Trans Jakarta Public Transport Service Company, uh, owned by the city government, aims to have an entirely electric powered bus fleet in over seven years. Jakarta based private taxi operator Bluebird has added a number of Tesla cars to its fleet as well. So we're clearly seeing that uh, the government is leading the transformation of the transport sector. Uh, to more sort of greener and cleaner transport through the adoption of EV vehicles. And it's backed by the manufacturing uh, and the mining uh, you know, strength of the country. So, so that's really what we look forward to. Um, with this, I'll hand it back to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Nishans. Uh, very interesting uh, topics. Uh, I think uh, the convergence of energy and uh, mobility, this is very interesting uh, topic. Uh, of course, uh, energy uh, become as a service. And uh, you know uh, how the digital can transform uh, every city around the world uh, to become uh, the modern city in order to uh, net zero emissions. I think this is very interesting topic, uh, Nishans. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, and the last uh, panelist, Pa Septian uh, Seto, uh, please. Uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pak uh, all the speakers and the participants. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, if you are in uh, UK, and very good evening in, in, in Jakarta. Yeah. So I guess this is a very interesting uh, topics. Yeah. 
uh, first of all, I think uh, if we talk about the EV, I think we have to discuss about the ecosystem. Yeah. So starting with uh, the supply chain of the electric vehicle, including and I think one of the most important as well is on the on the battery. And the second one is uh, on the uh, charging station network. But also, uh, we cannot forget about the recycle industry of the uh, of the used lithium battery. I think that's very important. So uh, I'm going to touch brief on uh, every aspect of the of the ecosystem and how Indonesia is going to position ourselves in this uh, value chain of the industry. Yeah. So I think uh, the previous speaker, uh, Christopher, has talked about uh, the supply of the nickel. Yeah. I guess uh, the current technology has evolved quite significantly. Yeah. Uh, I would say on the uh, HPAL itself, no, the HPAL uh, project that is and technology that is installed in Indonesia, I think is much improvement than what we have in, in, in Ramu, yeah, in Papua New Guinea. I spoke directly with, with Harita. They are the one who, who, who own the HPAL project, the first HPAL project that is in operation in Indonesia. They say to me that they can increase or ramp up the progress, you know, from 60% to 80% within four months. Yeah, this is something that is very incredible because uh, when you see the other HPAL project, usually it took you two to three years, yeah, just to ramping up from from 60% to 80%. Yeah, so uh, and no significant interruption so far on the operation. Uh, so I think this is. To show that the technological improvement on this technology is is is, is very significant. So I guess uh, right now we have like uh, seven HPAL project, if I'm not mistaken, and more will coming up uh, online. Uh, so uh, the second one that will be completed is the one that is uh, constructed by Huayo in Morowali. That will be in uh, end of December. Uh, the third one would be in. Morawali as well, built by the QMB, which is uh, the joint venture between Jingshan, Hanwa, and then the, the, the CATL. Yeah. Uh, so I think that will increase the output of the uh, MHP uh, or MSP uh, in Indonesia uh, very significant. And I think in terms of the nickel output, uh, this, this three combined, I think, will constitute about uh, maybe close to 120,000 ton of, 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 of nickel uh, metals. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is uh, will be very helpful to to fulfill the demand of the class one nickel uh, for the electric vehicle. The second one, I think uh, uh, the new technology to convert. Yeah the uh, upgraded uh, NPI into a uh, nickel made and then later on nickel made to the nickel sulfate. Yeah. Uh, there has been like 50,000, uh, sorry, close to 70,000 ton of, 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 of this uh, production facility already online in Morowali and then another 150,000 ton uh, will be up and running in, in Weda Bay next year. Yeah. So, this technology will simplify uh, the process yeah, to produce the nickel sulfate yeah, because I guess previously you need to build an HPAL, which is the investment is, is very high. And then I think the process is, is not as simple as, as, as making a, a NPI. Uh, but, you know, using this uh, converter technology from NPI to nickel made, nickel made to the nickel sulfate, uh, it's going to increase the supply uh, very significant. Uh, I remember when Ching San announced this project, uh, suddenly the nickel price dropped by more than 10 percent, yeah, immediately. So this show that uh, I guess Indonesia ability to fulfill the demand of the global super nickel supply is 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 is, is very strong. Uh, I would say that. Uh, but I think there is a caveat as well. Uh, this is something that government also put a concern on this yeah the first one i think christopher has mentioned yeah, about the tailing issue so we do not allow the deep sea tailing right now for the for the hpal process yeah so all has to go to tailing dam or brace stacking yeah 
tailing dam i think that is the, right now is the common uh, process that is being used in harita in obi in morowali uh, i think they have been uh, they are they are they are building this tailing dam uh, capacity quite big enough yeah? and we are very careful in assessing this as well to assess the situation and the location because in my view uh, tailing dam is it is it is a big mistake yeah to see that tailing dam is is better than the deep sea tailing yeah? because you know in indonesia you have a, a earthquake yeah and you have to be very careful on this yeah so the assessment from the government is very thorough on this uh, uh and there is one project later on as well that uh, the the investor is 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 willing to build the dry staking yeah which is uh, safer than the tailing dam but I think the initial investment and the operating expense is, is much higher. But I guess uh, this is also a development that we are very welcome as well. So I think the telling is, is an issue. Uh, I spoke to uh, Harita. They are willing. They are willing to put an additional investment actually to reprocess again the tailing, yeah? extract the iron uh, on the tailing, and then you know then you can reduce the amount of the pollutant as well. So this is uh, something that. Uh, if successful, I think it's, it's uh, another uh, uh, instrument for us to reduce this, this telling issue. The second one on the converter yeah, of the NPI to the nickel mid, I guess uh, the CO2 intensity of this process is, is quite high. Yeah? Because if you use coal-fired power plant, uh, I think the, the amount of the CO2 is, is quite high. Uh, and I think uh, not all I think uh, battery factory is 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 willing to to accept this product as well. So uh, right now we are working with them to reduce the amount of uh, emission uh, through uh, 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 the investment on the solar cell. Yeah, uh, we are working with Ching San on this. You know, we are going to build like six hundred hectares of solar cell in Morowali. So maybe that's it equal to we yeah, have 450 to 600 megawatt of 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 a solar cell so that can balance or reduce the carbon intensity of this uh, process as well uh, so i think uh, this is the i think some of the uh, key points here on this uh, supply of the nickel and i guess we need to be careful as well uh, because I think if we even if we mine out all the nickel in the world, yeah, it will not sufficient to meet the EV and the demand on the renewable energy. I'm I'm very sure of that. So I guess we need to build the uh, ecosystem so that we can recycle, yeah, the spent uh, lithium battery. And I think early this uh, early December we are going to groundbreak the first recycling battery uh, built by CATL in in Morowali, yeah. Uh, adjacent to this uh, the HPAL facility, uh, this is very important because uh, I guess we are going to have a more sustainable supply of nickel. Yeah, uh, the capacity is still small, still small it's about twenty thousand ton of, of of nickel. Yeah, but I think the the beauty of it is, uh, uh, I think the carbon intensity, you know, and you have like. A, circular economy on it so we do not rely always on the uh, mine nickel yeah um, I think uh, the last one I think on the EV investment uh, yeah maybe you already well aware on the Hyundai investment in Indonesia I guess this is uh, something that we are very welcome uh, but uh, I think in the near term we are going to announce maybe another one uh, that is going to, to invest in Indonesia and the position is very good because they can they, their product is actually uh, much cheaper yeah so they can address more mass market in Indonesia uh, I think their EV will be around I would say 150 to 200 million uh, rupiah yeah uh, with uh, distance capacity 160 170 kilometer for us so this is very good for a city car uh, hopefully we can announce this by uh, early next year and I guess uh, one important thing is uh, also the role of PLN and Pertamina. Yeah? Without the uh, enough uh, charging infrastructure, I would say 
the EV ecosystem in Indonesia will not grow as, as fast as we expect. And then if that is happening, then uh, the nickel of Indonesia will be enjoyed mostly by, by, by other countries. Yeah. Well, this is okay as well, but uh, the, what we want, I think, is we can optimize yeah, the use in the, in the country as well to reduce our, our emission. So I guess that's my uh, remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pak Septian. Uh, very interesting, uh, James. Of course, this is uh, part of the upstream of the battery process. Uh, there are uh, two uh, the technology of the nickel process for the upstreams. And uh, Pak Septian already uh, mentioned about the progress of the production of the nickel in Indonesia. Uh, I think this is very uh, good news for the uh, EV ecosystem industry for the Indonesia. And I think uh, starting uh, current current year, uh, this year, of course, uh, Indonesia will uh, increase about the industry ecosystem of the EV uh, from upstream to the downstream. And uh, Pak Septian, uh, thank you very much for the uh, sharing uh, the, the theme and of course, uh, appreciate to uh, the information. Okay, uh, we have uh, 10 minutes for the questions uh, and I already uh, have four questions. The first questions, uh, I think uh, this is from uh, from uh, Roman Nedilka, founder of chargeindo.com. Uh, the questions, uh, who will be more successful to grasp the EV opportunity in Indonesia, uh, global EV players or new Indonesian innovative startup or Indonesian enterprise expanding to the markets? Uh, these questions to Pak. Septian uh, Seto, please, Pak Septian. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Pak Hikmat, uh, yeah. can you repeat again the, the question? Okay. Uh, for this, uh, in terms of EV, who will be more successful to grasp the EV opportunity in Indonesia? It's mean, uh, who will the most opportunity on the EV industry in Indonesia, a global player or new Indonesian innovative startups? Well, okay. Uh, so if you talk about the EV itself and, and, and or, or the battery, yeah, it requires, I think, a lot of investment. Yeah. So I think uh, it is a very good idea from the Ministry of State-owned Enterprise to set up the, the IBC yeah, uh, because I guess the IBC would be uh, the one that has the capacity uh, to, to finance the investment. Uh, so uh, in our uh, investment strategy right now, you know, IBC has a, has a cooperation with the CATL, which is the largest battery uh, maker in the world and the LG, uh, which is I think the second, uh, second one uh, largest battery producer. So, I think they guess. I think this is a very good cooperation and leverage for the Indonesian company. Yeah. I know there are several uh, private company as well. You know, uh, Indonesia Harita is the one that is very advanced in terms of this uh, in yeah, uh, battery supply chain. Even though that they are mostly invested on the uh, upstream side, yeah. But uh, we are in a negotiation with. Uh, one uh, Taiwanese company as well uh, to invest on the battery swap. Yeah, uh, this is will be this will be very attractive for the motorcycle. Yeah, because uh, you know in Indonesia there are already several moto motorcycle producer, electric motorcycle producer. You know, Gesits. You know, there are several others as well. You know, uh, I know uh, Goto also will 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 uh, invest on this uh, on this uh, area as well. So uh, the current uh, price of the motorcycle is still very expensive. Yeah, it's about 26, 27 million US dollar yeah, without the battery. So uh, what uh, we are planning right now is to reduce the price to maybe 16 to 18 million uh, rupiah. So it will be very comparable with the uh, first 
uh, entry of a, a of a combustion engine motorcycle ya like Honda Beat ya. So we believe with this, uh, this is going to speed up the electrification of the industry. So I guess it is not a matter who is going to win between foreign or the domestic company, but I guess the job of the government is how we can create the collaboration between them so that you know both you know get the the, the benefit. Obviously, they want to to get the profit, but at the same time, the electrification in in the country is also improving, especially on the motorcycle. Because if we are successful in the motorcycle, then it's going to be much easier uh, to do the electrification. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pak Septian, for the answers of the questions. I think. Uh, It's very clear uh, the answers uh, about the opportunity of the collaborations between the globally partners and the locally uh, enterprise. I think this is very good uh, situation uh, from the governments of Indonesia. Uh, I have the questions uh, for the Diana uh, from uh, Yidi Sondi, director and CEO of Motor Asia Pacific. The questions: How does the green bond implementations support EV development in Indonesia? Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll take this opportunity to also um, cover of what Pak Idam um, uh, Muhammad Fakri has also um, asked in the chat. Is it what is the main difference between conventional financing with uh, sustainable financing? Why would you know companies tend to raise sustainable? Um, or sustainability link uh, financing rather than conventional. So I think from um, an investor and also from a lender kind of perspective, there is actually a big shortage of um, green assets. So assets, you know, from our case means green loans um, and green bonds. So when we look at, let's say, a few key uh, points as to why companies would want to go for sustainable financing, you would have uh, more investor diversification. You have more access. You have higher access um, to investors who prefer to invest in sustainable projects and sustainable businesses. Um, there are a lot of investors you know, who now have a clear uh, direction that you know, they will not invest in non-sustainable projects. That's one. There is undersupply in the market. There are not enough um, you know, green projects out there. And there's a lot of uh, banks you know, who are more keen because we are uh, you know, wanting to actually head towards net zero as well. Um, From the borrower perspective, uh, we are also seeing some trends um, in terms of, let's say, pricing and uh, oversubscription levels for bonds. So talking about bonds, we have been looking at the trends for the last uh, about four years up to year to date 2021. The trend is actually increasing where sustainable bonds um, oversubscription rate is around 5.6 times on average versus conventional uh, bonds oversubscription rate of around 4.6. And the trend is actually increasing year on year. From a loan perspective, or even from a, a bond side, we're seeing that um, sustainable bonds and loans tend to be priced um, at least at par or better than conventional. So I think these are just some of the benefits um, for companies who are looking to tap into it. It's really about diversifying your investor base, your bank um, you know, relationship base as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Diana, for the The clear answers of the how uh, EV development in Indonesia can implement the green bonds of the implementation. Very good uh, answers. And uh, I have a question uh, for uh, Nissan Sodani. The first question is uh, in Indonesia, in terms of a widely horizon high level projection from PLN point of view, how many years from now the market will be fully emerged, such uh, the supply chains, users, buyers. I think uh, this is uh, like uh, the sense uh, analysis of the each city of the global, including uh, Jakarta city. Uh, the question from Enrico Batubara. Uh, please, Anishans, your answers. Uh, thank you for that question. I think uh, it is, well, it would take, you, what you've asked about is is not relating to one thing. It's about the whole ecosystem, uh, you know, sort of decarbonizing and uh, getting to uh, uh, carbon neutral situation. And I think that that is a quite an ambitious 
uh, target to get to. And it would take, I mean, even for developed countries, it's uh, it they, they're not there yet. They're working towards it. And I think what we've seen as some of the examples is how the EV uh, e-mobility and EV charging infrastructure is picking up in these cities. So I think what we've seen and what we've uh, heard from uh, here as well is that uh, there, there are multiple uh, opportunities that uh, people are working in, in in Indonesia. One is around on the uh, the regulatory side in terms of encouraging people and incentivizing people to adopt electric vehicles. The other one is around the whole manufacturing, mining, battery side of things to make those battery uh, uh, available for those EV things. As well as you know, uh, from yourself in terms of PLN and other energy players to actually provide that renewable energy to make it more cleaner. So I think it's for all these stakeholders to work together to to sort of achieve that objective. And it would take, uh, you know, I would say decades. It would not be an overnight uh, win, and it's not been anywhere else in the world. It would take so quite some time to get there. But I think if if the uh, if the transformation is started now. Uh, the next uh, 10 to 20 years are quite critical in achieving that. OK, uh, thank you, uh, Nishans, for the answers. Uh, very clear enough uh, about the how the time to fully market MS in uh, Indonesia, especially, but not fully of the all the process. Uh, we receive many questions, but uh, because the time, I think uh, this is uh, for 5 p.m. And uh, I think time is uh, up. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for the all panelists and all participants. Uh, the summarize of the this uh, event's uh, webinar, uh, if we adoptions, it should be accelerate from the ecosystem industry, starting from upstreams, meaning the batteries manufacture process, and also the funding strategy uh, for the uh, lending capital in Indonesia, uh, collaborates globally uh, partners and locally partners. Uh, this is uh, the uh, key words of from the Pak Septian Seto, uh, the collaborations each others, uh, about the globally and the local, in order to uh, encourage uh, the EV adoption accelerate at Indonesia. Again, thank you very much for all of the participants and uh, the, all the panelists. Thank you very much and a good uh, afternoon and good, uh, good day uh, for everyone. I Back to uh, Ellen, thank you. Thank you, Pak Hikmat, for moderating this session. And thank you, all the panelists as well, for sharing your insights into this uh, EV industry in Indonesia. Um, We've just uh, been a very uh, exciting uh, webinar. We really received so many questions from our audience today. Uh, we'll try to get back to them on the email where possible. And yeah, thank you very much for everyone who is attending and be part of this uh, session. I would like to thank our sponsors as well, Brompton, G4S, and Jakarta Line, uh, Jakarta Land. All right, thank you.